drive back early afternoon, and then he had to turn around and drive up to Michigan, so uh, I feel for him. Uh, so let's pray that God will anoint his ministry today. Uh, and of course, let's be praying for the ministry uh, this morning and tonight, the services. Please remember that tonight's Harvest Sunday as well, and we want to honor our staff, uh, our school staff. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer, and then we will uh, turn to the third of our four parts in our Reformation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We praise you for uh, your nearness to us. We thank you that you have made it possible for us to draw near to you. And uh, when we do, you have promised that you would draw near to us. And we praise you for that. We're asking that you would uh, settle upon this place and during this hour of Bible study and uh, study of history that you would honor us with your presence in the worship service this morning and tonight. And would you be glorified uh, not only this day, but every day. And wherever your people are gathered around the world today on this this, uh, great day of Christian celebration, uh, would you be glorified? Would you be near to them? Would you you protect your people that are gathered uh, in your name? And would your kingdom grow because of the preaching and singing of your word We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Uh, I do want to mention before we start uh, this third, uh, again, third part of a four-part series uh, on the Reformation. Uh, Some have asked me what uh, material, what books, what's something out there that uh, you would recommend. Uh, There are several uh, that I recommend. Uh, The two best ones, I actually didn't bring down with me. Maybe I'll bring them next week. Uh, They're up in the office. Uh, but they're pretty robust. Uh, they're uh, quite uh, meaty. Uh, of course, I, you would enjoy them, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, they are um, you know, 800, 1,000 pages long. But this is a good one. This is an older book, uh, but it has been updated. Uh, this is an older edition. Mark Knoll, a well-known church historian. This book called Turning Points. It's not all on the Reformation, uh, but... A lot of, uh, quite a few of the chapters in here deal specifically with the Reformation. And then the chapters before the Reformation give background to uh, the era that we are speaking of. So uh, this, I would certainly recommend this book uh, here. It's called Turning Points by Mark Knoll, N-O-L-L. And I can put this, in fact, uh, Dad, will you come get this and just put it on the connection table there so people can uh, glance through it? Uh, Thank you. Uh, Yes, feel free to take a look at that book. And uh, don't take it because I have made, uh, I have used it a little bit for these uh, lectures. We are talking this morning about uh, the uh, branches of the Reformation. In fact, let me move forward here. Now, you may not be able to see this, and I apologize, I did not get uh, copies of. Uh, this lecture. Uh, I I will email them again if you will send me an email. Uh, Once I've finished all four lectures, I will uh, email them to you. So that won't be this week. That'll be the following week uh, since next week will be the last of the four lectures. Uh, But uh, in these notes, you will have this little graphic that I created. And uh, the top arrow moving across is, is RCC, Roman Catholic Church. Uh, That is for the West, uh, from 1054 forward, uh, was considered, uh, until the Reformation, the church. So when you spoke of the church, you meant the church that was overseen by Rome. Uh, Of course, if you were in the East, that was different. That was a different story. Uh, Constantinople would have been one of the, uh, would have been the head of uh, that church. They didn't call it the head. They had an archbishop. Uh, who presided over more of a committee. Uh, Moscow by this time also would have been a major, kind of the third uh, center for Christian religion. Uh, Jerusalem in the past had been, but by this time, at this time, Jerusalem is uh, under the control of Muslims. Uh, There is a Christian presence there, of course, and a, a small Jewish presence, but Jerusalem was not significant at all. 
Jerusalem did not become significant until uh, later. Uh, it was kind of lost in this, um, these Middle Ages and early modern period. Uh, but what I have here is I have, you see the four arrows dropping down, and the first arrow drops down to the bottom. Uh, that's the Lutheran Reformation, uh, 1517. We talked about that last week. The second arrow that drops down, if you can't read that on the screen, is the Reformed or Calvinist branch. Uh, the Reformed branch is a, actually a two-pronged branch. Uh, but we'll talk about that uh, today. Uh, the third one is uh, the Anabaptist, or what's called the Radical Reformation. And uh, we will also discuss that briefly this morning. And then the fourth one, the one nearest to the top there, uh, is the Anglican or the English Reformation. And all of these reformations, which is really what they, they are, they were, these reformations took place... They began uh, quite quickly, uh, and they were not unrelated. There, there is uh, some relation between them, and there is also between them some connection to uh, Luther. Uh, the Lutheran Reformation, of course, is the first on this chart. And each of these, and, and I will try to tie some of these to Luther and show you what the connection is. But let's talk about first, uh, let's, let me show you this. This is a panoramic of what's called the Reformation Wall. Now uh, you can find it in Geneva, Switzerland. Now Geneva, of course, is one of the main sites. Has anyone ever been to Geneva? Okay, you have, all right. And uh, have you seen this wall? You didn't, you didn't see it, oh, you should. You should, you should have gone and visited this wall, the Reformation Wall. Uh, in the center are four of the main figures. I'll show you a picture of them in a moment. On the side, on either side, there are, I believe, three figures, uh, life-sized figures of some of the early reformers, particularly in this area. Uh, but we'll talk about them. Here are the four central figures uh, you have uh, in order from your, let's see here, let me look at it. Yes, from your left to right. Uh, you have one named Guillaume Forel. He was very influential on, uh, he was a Frenchman. He was very influential on John Calvin, who was also from France. John Calvin is the second person there from your left to the right. Uh, the third person is Theodore Beza, who was a uh, colleague uh, closely associated with Calvin. And then uh, John Knox, who of course was influential up in the British Isles. So those are four, for, at least for Geneva, those are four figures within what's called the Calvinist or the Reformed branch of the Reformation. Uh, this, let, me, let me talk about uh, John Calvin here. You have two pictures here. These are the two main figures within what's called the Reformed branch. The Reformed branch of the Reformation. You have on the left, John Calvin. You have on the right, a guy by the name, a Swiss man named Ulrich Zwingli. Ulrich Zwingli. And you may have heard of him. But let's, let's talk about John Calvin for just a little bit. And he, was, of course, was from France. Uh, he was... A uh, quite different from Martin Luther. We, I tried to describe Martin Luther last week. Martin Luther was a, a, um, a very was raised under a lot of superstition. He he had really struggled with faith. He uh, had a little uh, quite a, quite an explosive personality. Martin Luther did. Uh, he was known for outbursts of anger. Uh, he was known as a pretty flamboyant person. Uh, even though he was a very fearful person. Uh, John Calvin was a little different in that he was not so flamboyant. He was not you know, prone to outbursts of anger, but he was a very anxious person. He was a very uh, fearful person as well, uh, yet uh, he held himself together better than Martin Luther did. Uh, John Calvin was raised in France. France, of course, was a, has always been, until the French Revolution, a stronghold for the Catholic Church. Remember, uh, France was the place where the uh, eight Catholic popes uh, moved their headquarters, so to speak, to France, having on France. And so the French king always had a lot of power in the church and uh, basically ruled the church. 
so when Luther, uh, when he published his, began publishing his thoughts and started entering into the public spotlight, his thoughts, of course, began to disseminate throughout the empire. And, of course, they reached uh, France. Uh, but really, Erasmus was more influential in France than Luther was. Uh, France had much more success uh, uh, stamping out Lutheranism, uh, so much so that from France, the Luth Lutherans, uh, they, they fled France. They were pretty much uh, persecuted, seriously persecuted. And so they fled from France, and that was the way of the church keeping control. And John Calvin was born into that uh, setting. He was raised, I should say, into that, that kind of of life. He was born in 1509, so he is quite a bit younger than the other reformers. Uh, he uh, w was sent to university, I believe, at about the age of 13 or so, or 12 or 13, which was normal at that time for 12 and 13 year olds to be sent to university. Uh, his, he, he actually studied law. Remember Martin Luther, he wanted to go study law. Uh, but uh, God changed his mind. He, he went and studied theology instead. Uh, uh, John Calvin, though, did study law. He actually uh, gained his law education before turning to the study of, of the biblical languages. And uh, he studied at the University of Paris. And it was at the University of Paris that he and a circle of friends began to, uh, they began following the teachings of Erasmus first, and they really began to uh, buy into a lot of the ref Reformation ideas that were already being circulated. And Luther had already published his uh, some work, several works. But uh, again, they're in Paris, so the church began to crack down on these kinds of people. So uh, John Calvin and his friends they fled Paris. Uh, still very young, they fled Paris. Uh, they moved around. Calvin moved around various places. He finally settled in Switzerland in the city of, of Basel where Erasmus uh, lived and from where he wrote. Uh, he, he settled in Basel for a, a couple of years. And then uh, one night he was traveling and happened to travel through uh, the city of Geneva, which if you, I, I don't have a map up here, but Geneva is located in the far west of Switzerland, right near the border of uh, France, Italy, and then, of course, Switzerland. And Lake Geneva is there. So it was a strategic place. But he happened to be passing through there. And uh, uh, it came about that uh, as he was uh, there, and, and just spending one night there, that uh, this man... Let me give you this picture here. The man on the your left, far left there, uh, Guillaume Forel, he had long fled uh, France. But he was uh, the, the kind of the, the religious leader there in Geneva. And he heard, he was quite a bit older, 40 some years older than uh, Calvin. And he had heard that Calvin was there. And Calvin already had a reputation. In fact, he had already been... Uh, written the, I believe by this time, he had already written his first edition of the Institutes, and he had done some other writing and lecturing uh, as well. But Guillaume Forel had heard about this, was impressed with this young man, and uh, compelled him to stay. And so Calvin did. Calvin stayed in Geneva. Uh, well, a little bit later, uh, uh, some years later, uh, the Geneva, the city of Geneva, was composed of... of a mixture of people. You had the native Genevans who were uh, Roman Catholic for the most part, or at least a large portion. Uh, then you had a very large influx, their proximity to France, of Frenchmen, French reformers, people who were, who were not, who were turning against the Catholic Church. So you had this the volatile mixture of people in Geneva, and they're all the time going back. Now, above all of that, you have the, the, the 13 states, we'll call them, of Switzerland. Of the 13 states of Switzerland, uh, they, uh, some of them were strongly Roman Catholic, but me, most of them were strongly independent when it came to civil matters. So they were still Roman Catholic, but they were resisting the Holy Roman Empire. 
So there was a kind of a, a, a bittersweet relationship between the Swiss and the, the powers that be, both church and state. So Geneva was kind of the, was one of the main centers of, of the activity, uh, the political activity going on here. And so initially, uh, Calvin was received very well. But then he crossed some of the native Genevans. Uh, he and Guillaume For, uh, Farrell kind of crossed them and they chased them out. They, they told them to leave. They left. Uh, I, I believe he went back probably to, to Basel uh, where he had been before. Uh, but later though, uh, again, just to show the political sway, you know, the influx of more refugees probably influenced this. Later, the city of Geneva, the council, invited Calvin to come back and uh, they offered him a very prestigious pr uh, position of basically overseeing all the clergy of of the city. Now, why is that important? That's important because the clergyman in Geneva, uh, this was of course set up by the Roman Catholic Church, they pretty much oversaw, uh, they were extremely influential in civil matters. So they could, they were very influential with the city council. Uh, so, so imagine, uh, Frankfurt City Council, if, if they had, uh, some of them do have a, a True fear of God, some of them don't. But if they, if they really had a fear of God, and for them that meant fear for, of the church and the church authority, and uh, the, say Pastor Davis had the ability to declare their sins forgiven or not, and they really bought into that, they really felt like that was you know, his authority, God-given authority, uh, they would carefully consider what Pastor Davis would say to them, Right? And that's, that's what's happening here in Geneva and other places. And so Calvin had a lot of power. Now, before he accepted the invitation back, though, uh, he, uh, he gave him a condition. And his condition was he had written a, a, a piece called the Ecclesiastical uh, Ordinances. And it was what he thought the church should be. And so he said, you have to accept this and you have to let me make the church in Geneva this. And they accepted it. They said, yes. So that gave him immense, in fact, so much so that sometimes people have called Geneva uh, Calvin's Geneva uh, because he had so much power in that city. And uh, today it's still, you know, a re reformed, very extremely liberal uh, city, Geneva is. But, so for instance, um, in Geneva, in Calvin's Geneva, uh, well, I certainly would not be able to wear this tie. It's far too bright. Uh, probably Dr. Dallar's tie would be, would, would be banned as well because it has stripes. Uh, I don't know. Um, the blue, certainly not. Red, certainly not. Uh, very muted. Very, uh, uh, I'll get into a few of the other things that, that happened. But they, most of us would not be able to uh, probably even visit Geneva then. Now today, different story. Uh, in fact, today homosexual, uh, homosexuality uh, is rampant there. That's kind of a base for uh, the homosexual movement in Europe. But uh, v radically and, and strictly enforced what he thought the church should be. Uh, in fact, anything, it's, it's interesting because we, we are conservative relative to this world, right? We are, we're very conservative relative to the culture we live in. We would be extremely liberal relative to John Calvin's Geneva. And I'm talking about outwardly, all right? Outwardly in our appearance, we'd be extremely liberal. Uh, there's no way in the world that cross would be able to be up there on the wall. Uh, that, that would be an idol, if, the, if we had a cross in our church. Of course, a screen. I, that's, <laughs> you can't imagine that. All right, so we're, uh, that's, we're, very, we're very Roman Catholic uh, in his, his mind, all right? So uh, those kinds of things. So th that's just a little bit. I need to keep moving uh, on John Calvin. Any questions about John Calvin? I'm not giving a theological description. I'm just kind of talking a little bit how he fits in. Uh, he'll come back up in, in a moment. In fact, let me mention this. Oh, here, here is what I believe are his main uh, contributions to 
the Reformation era. Uh, number one, his Institutes of Christian Religion. He, he wrote them very young. I think he was like 29. But then he continued to expand them until now they're, they're pretty sizable uh, books. Uh, my edition is two, two volumes I have. I've read them several times. I, I recommend you reading them, read them. Uh, I, of course, we don't agree with everything there. But I agree with most that's there as did John Wesley and others. Uh, so classic literature, Institutes of Christian Religion. The reason these were important is because these uh, volumes became a significant uh, theological basis for a large part of the Reformation. Secondly, Reformed Ecclesiology. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about what that is. But basically, he came in and said, we're rejecting entirely what the Roman Catholic Church says church is, and I'm going to give you something different. Now, it was all of his own making. No, it wasn't. Uh, he, was, he had collected thoughts from Erasmus, from Luther, from others. Now, interestingly, uh, Calvin and Luther, they never met. Okay, Luther is quite a bit older than Calvin. Uh, they never met, but they had respect for one another. Uh, Luther had read some of Calvin's works. Uh, Calvin, uh, Calvin, of course, had read Luther. Uh, but uh, Luther doesn't really say anything about Calvin. He doesn't really comment anything about Calvin. But Luther's younger colleague, you may remember him, Philip Melanchthon, who taught with uh, Luther at the University of Wittenberg, uh, Melanchthon and Calvin corresponded. They were close to the same age. They corresponded, and Calvin would frequently talk about Luther to Melanchthon. And uh, Calvin was not uh, greatly impressed with Luther. He respected him, but was not personally impressed with Luther. And in fact, uh, there are, let me see if I can find, I have some quotes here. Uh, get the right page. Here we go. Here's a little bit of what he said. Uh, Luther is 25 years older than Calvin. Uh, Calvin uh, was critical in his, one of his letters to uh, to length on saying that Luther was immoderately passionate and audacious in character. Uh, he, he was, he actually told Melanchthon that Luther was dangerous for the church because of his flamboyant, his, his, uh, his uh, proneness to anger and quick, uh, he had a short fuse. And Calvin said that's dangerous to the cause. Uh, and he was probably right. Uh, anyway, so that's kind of uh, the, the interaction between Calvin and Luther. Ulrich Zwingli, oh, let me close uh, end with Calvin with this. The Dutch Reformed Church then, even though uh, Calvin w had not actually been in what's called the Netherlands, uh, his thought became uh, the standard through others, Martin Bucer, Theodore Beza, for what is now known and then known as the Dutch Reformed Church. That's important because later uh, in some other lectures, I'll talk about how that ties to us uh, with Arminianism. Uh, but that's not for today or next week. Now, Ulrich Zwingli, this other guy. Let's see, where is he? There he is. The other guy, uh, not the guy, the, the clean-shaven guy, but the guy who needs a haircut along his ears. Uh, that's Ulrich Zwingli. He was quite a bit older than, than uh, Calvin as well. And in fact, he had already started the reform. Uh, if Geneva is way down here, uh, you've been to Geneva as well, right? Oh, you have it. Oh, okay. All right. So you've been to Zurich? Yes. All right. So Zurich is on up here in the far east of Swiss, Switzerland. And before Calvin ever arrived in uh, Switzerland, uh, Zwingli was already beginning to reform the church in uh, the city of Zurich. Uh, Zurich and, and the city of Bern were the two main cities, uh, most influential cities in, in Switzerland. Again, all of Switzerland, it was not an independent nation, but they had largely gained civil independence from the Holy Roman Empire uh, because the Holy Roman Empire continued to lose uh, uh, authority and ability to control these outposts, so to speak. Uh, Zwingli was born near Zurich. That's where he ministered. 
Uh, he was respected in that area. He nearly died from uh, what we know as the Black Death, the plague that rampaged through Europe and part of Asia. Uh, but uh, he survived, and out of that, he embraced what uh, we know as the doctrine of election, uh, the doctrine of unconditional election that God had, had sovereignly and against or despite his will chosen him to uh, salvation and to a special uh, ministry. Uh, indulgences were sold in this area as well. The same thing that was happening in Germany uh, when Luther witnessed that with Tetzel. Uh, the same thing was happening by a man named Solomon in, in Zurich. But that was not what caused the Reformation in, in, in Switzerland uh, or in, in Zurich. Uh, there were, let me put these, yeah, I'll put these three because I, I need to move a little more quickly. There were, I believe, three main issues in Zurich. One was uh, theology of church and state. Now, uh, the John Calvin, as well as Wingley, they had a particular view of the church and state that maybe you share, maybe you don't. But that is... That the state has the responsibility of enforcing what the laws that the church makes. What do you think of that? Uh, so for Zwingli, that was, that was exactly... Now, they were very Catholic in that way of thinking. That was the Roman Catholic way of thinking. But they, they formulated a, a reformed view of this, church and state. Secondly is iconoclasm. That is the destruction, uh, the banning of icons. Now, the banning of icons uh, began here, and then it influenced Calvin. Calvin bought wholly into it, and I've already explained a little bit of that in Geneva. So you would not be able to have the screen. You would not be able to have pictures. You would not be able to have, uh, you know, if you have, uh, my Bible's back there, but if you had a, a Bible with, with um, you know, n neat pictures, and any time, mean, in the church, no, no, no stained glass windows, all right? In fact, at this time, okay, these churches, remember, in Switzerland and, and uh, throughout the empire, these have been built as Roman Catholic churches, right? So what do you have in Roman Catholic churches? You have beautiful stained glass windows. You have, you have statues. You have icons. You have, it's rich in symbolism, right? Uh, even today, I, I love to go into the cathedrals, whether it's uh, Anglican or, or Roman Catholic or Lutheran. Uh, I love to go into those, and those are the ones that will still have a lot of symbolism, right? Uh, and I, I think it's it's neat. I love to see I love to see those. Uh, but the Reformed branch, they actually went into these cities, for instance, in Geneva. And they, they would crash out, they would smash these beautiful stained glass windows, and they would replace it with something plain. They would go and they would tear down these statues. They would take out anything, and they called it because they called them idols. Now, why do you suppose they would call them idols? Why is that? Okay, well, they're a graven image. Obviously, they're not images of, of God. Right, because you have several things going on in the Roman Catholic Church that leads to that the appearance of worshiping the saints. Uh, you know, you're you're portraying uh, various of the saints. Uh, you're you're portraying uh, the Mary of uh, the, the mother of Jesus, Mary the mother of Jesus, and so it comes across to these reformers as if you're worshiping them. So what do you do with an idol? You smash it. That's what you did in the Old Testament, right? And so that's what they did, and they cleansed the, the churches and made them very plain. And so that's what iconoclasm is. I have a really interesting book uh, in my library on this. It's, it's a pretty fascinating story. And then they had a, a different idea. This came from Zwingli and then became Calvin's view as well. Zwingli was very influential on Calvin. Uh, but Zwingli uh, rejected the Catholics' view of the, of the Mass and communion being the real body and blood, the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. So he rejected that, and he said, no, these are, these are merely symbols. And these symbols, the bread and the wine, they, they're, there's nothing miraculous in them, but when, when they are present and when we 
take communion together. The, the spiritual presence of Christ is with us, but there's nothing that changes in this bread and, and this wine. Now, we fall into that tradition. That's our tradition. That's our theology as well. We have embraced that theology uh, in the Wesleyan movement. Uh, we embrace that theology uh, more so than our own tradition out of the, uh, the uh, Church of England, which continue to, to affirm transubstantiation, that these elements actually become the body and the blood of Christ. So those are Zwingli's uh, contributions. Then we have the Radical Reformation, what's called the Radical Reformation. This is the Anabaptist, uh, the Anabaptist tradition. Now, the Anabaptists, uh, in fact, let me begin with a story here. Uh, on January 5th, ni- uh, 15, yeah, 19, uh, January 5th, 1527, Felix Mance, a young man of only 29 years old, was led to the fish market in Zurich, forced into a boat, and rowed out to the deepest part of the Lamont River. I believe I have a picture here. Here we go. Uh, I, I didn't have time to go back. I, I have several pictures. I've been here and I have pictures selfies probably on this bridge and I've been to the church there as well this is where uh, Zwingli this is where he ministered this is where he he wasn't given quite the absolute power that John Calvin was in in, uh, Geneva but he was still very influential once he was given oversight of this uh, church here so on this river uh, Felix Mance, 29 years old, was led to the fish market in Zurich, forced into a boat on this river, rode out to the deepest part of the Lamont River. He bound hand and foot to a sturdy pole. And in his final moment, he sang with a loud voice, Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. And at the appointed time, the illegitimate son of one of Zurich's canons, one of their uh, councilmen, an opponent of Zwingli, was thrown into this very cold and this very icy blue water and drowned. His crime was that of rebaptizing. In March of 1526, the city of Zurich had appointed such a death for such a crime, marking the first martyrdom, Felix uh, Mance was the first martyr, this was the first martyrdom of a Protestant at the hands of another Protestant. There have, been, there have been many martyrdoms of Protestants at the hands of Catholics. But now the Reformation era took on a new twist. And that was you have Protestants uh, actually putting to death other Protestants. So you have in the city of Zurich a reformed city. They were no longer Roman Catholic. They were thoroughly reformed, but still very heavy-handed in the sense that the state and the church went hand in hand. What the law that the church set, put in place, the the state was obliged in carrying out, uh, enforcing, and that's exactly what we have going on. One of those laws that had been set in place is that a it was illegal to rebaptize a person. So why would a person want to be rebaptized? Well, first of all, uh, as Catholics, uh, many of them, most of them, oh, well, actually, let me back up. It was law, okay, Roman Catholic law, and so therefore state law, uh, before Zurich was reformed, that you had to be baptized into the church. It was illegal not to be a member of the church. What do you think of that? So it was uh, this Holy Roman Empire, right? If you're a citizen of this empire, you will be a member of a church. And if you're not, there's, there are serious penalties. Well, to be a member of the church, you have to be baptized, of course, as an infant. So an infant comes, they're baptized. Well, the Anabaptists, many of them right here in Zurich, uh, which Zurich could, it was one of the places where it kind of, uh, grew, it became a branch of the Reformation, Felix Mance and others, they rejected the idea of uh, infant baptism. They believed that baptism 
should be uh, what they call believer's baptism. A person should be baptized uh, having consciously exercised faith. Now, there is a doctrine though before that. There was another doctrine they embraced before that led them to accepting that doctrine. So it was a logical conclusion for them. So they had believer's baptism, but there's one that goes before that, and that is what's called the believer's church. And that is, they're kind of like early Puritans. They, their doctrine of the church was, first of all, separation of church and state. That, that's the first thing that has to happen. There needs to be no relationship between the church and matters of salvation and civil matters. So that was the first thing. That was going to be a hard sell in Zurich, all right, or anywhere in Switzerland. Nonetheless, they embraced that. Secondly, only those who are truly believers and evidence the fruit of the Spirit in their lives can be and ought to be members. Now, by members, we have to think broadly in what our membership is here, okay? We, we, uh, membership is different then. Membership there is, you know, you are required to be a member. But they were advocating, uh, no, everyone shouldn't be a member. Only the believers should be a member. And those who do not, uh, those who do not uh, abide by the laws of this church should be cast out of the church. Now, there are elements there that we practice, but we're not as, we're not as radical as what uh, Felix Mance and these other guys were because we, we happily invite sinners every week to church, right? We happily invite them to come in. Well, remember, church is a little bit different. If you come to church, you're going to be taking communion. You're going to be uh, participating. It, it's, the light, it, it's for Christians. Coming to church is for Christians, they don't preach evangelistic sermons, all right? The, if you, church is for believers. It's not for sinners, it's for believers. That's the mindset going on here. And they believed that only believers, those who are clearly believing, uh, should be part of that congregation. Well, in order to do that, then, they would rebaptize. So your baptism was worthless if you were baptized as an infant. That was worthless. And so you'd rebaptize. Well, that's where uh, cities like Zurich, they outlawed that. And death was, actually death by drowning was the specific penalty for rebaptism. All right. Anyone have, is it clear why they chose that? All right. Death by drowning. You rebaptize somebody, you get baptized permanently. All right. That's the idea. Now, Anabaptists um, is not something, I, I've heard many people say this mistakenly, that Anabaptist means anti-Baptist, all right? Anti-Baptism. That's not what Anabaptist means. Anabaptists, and they call themselves Anabaptists, Anna, the Greek word, simply means uh, to, uh, to, to, re, to, uh, to redo something. So Anabaptist means rebaptize. Not anti-Baptist. So uh, let's make sure that we're clear on that. Now some of them were called, and very quickly, uh, their opponents called them anti-Baptists because of their doctrine of rebaptism. They felt like they were rejecting infant baptism, therefore they were rejecting baptism altogether. Uh, but they were not rejecting. Uh, Anabaptists do, do not uh, uh, reject baptism. They embrace what's called believer's baptism. And uh, let me uh, go back here. Sorry, I didn't get these in order. So they embrace believer's church. It's a new doctrine or a, a different doctrine of the church than the Roman Catholic. Believer's baptism, separation of church and state. The Baptists, today's Baptist churches, are a mixture of uh, largely from this radical reformation. Uh, but it's really hard for any of us today in the American church to say, yeah, we're part of the branch of the, uh, you know, the Anabaptists or the Reformed or the English Reformation. All right, so here, here again, the four branches. Uh, the fact is that most churches in America are a mixture of these, all right? Uh, so, for instance, a Methodist would be a mixture of Anglican and Anabaptist. And there were some Calvinists among the Methodists. And so there would even be some who would, who would embrace the Reformed tradition. 
So we are not neatly, like I would not be able to just drop down another line and under the Anglican or the Church of England and say, yeah, that's where we are. Uh, we have nothing to do with the others. It's not that simple. The Baptist tradition, uh, even though some church historians put them under the Anabaptists, and that's largely their influence, you can't do that either. Uh, Southern Baptist right now is controlled by Reformed theologians. So uh, Reformed, Anabaptists, and, and then even some Anglican uh, is there. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's not easy. It's a complicated thing. Are there any questions so far? How are they able to get from the uh, separation of church and state to the com- from the combination of church and state? Was it because those that were in the religious realm were actually in the civil positions too? I mean, it seems to me like that's a, an opposite jump from you know, the combination of the church and state all the way to the opposite extreme, where it's the separation. Mm-hmm. So was it mm-hmm. the clergy that was influential in the political realm that was able to make this happen? The separation itself? Um, yes, but most of them were removed. I mean, just about all of them were removed. That's why, uh, and of course you know this, but the Anabaptists were all the time fleeing. They were the ones who, all through Europe, they were so persecuted that they were fleeing. So they had a hard time settling down for quite a few decades, settling down. And, uh, yeah, sure, sure. And of course, most famously, as we know, uh, the Amish and the Mennonites and, and the uh, German Baptists and, and that, that world uh, trace their lineage to the Anabaptist tradition. Now, uh, they became even more radical than the Anabaptists, uh, not, not just in their church and state, but then many of them actually rejected baptism altogether. Uh, that was not what the Anabaptists started out to do. But some did later. Uh, so I, I, the only way this was implemented was uh, it, w- it was not implemented in, in at least in this era, in, in Switzerland, in um, in England, in, in Germany. Uh, for the most part, it was there were so you just had little areas throughout Europe where there was, this was practiced, where the Anabaptists had some. Now, there's one other thing that caused great persecution for the Anabaptists, and that was they strongly held to freedom of the will in that a person has something to, they would use the word like contribute or something to, to do towards their salvation. Now, we're not, we, we would carefully word that, because salvation is a gift from God, right? It's, it's, uh, grace is something we cannot earn. So we'd be careful about this. So they were accused frequently of Pelagianism, which is the doctrine that I can earn my salvation. Well, maybe there, I'm sure there were some Pelagians among them, but they were not generally Pelagians. So that caused great persecution wherever they went as well, and maybe even as much or more than any of this stuff. They also had the view, as they were articulating their believer's church theology, they were very open about the fact that they believed that since the early centuries, Christian centuries, for about a thousand years or more, the true church had been lost. And so when you have somebody coming, coming out in a city and they're teaching that we are now the true church, like we've recovered the true church, like, like, come to our church. We've recovered. The rest of those churches out there, they're all, her- they're all uh, uh, heretical. Uh, but we've recovered the true church. It's been lost for a thousand years. Uh, it sounds like, almost like you're a, a Mormon, right? Uh, so that was happening. So they were just very prov- provocative people. They, were, they had some really good points, things that we have embraced, uh, even in our own tradition. But they were very provocative. And, uh, th- but that, everything in this, in this era was, seemed to be extremes almost. Uh, the English Reformation, uh, let me show you. This is a King Henry VIII. This is his first wife, Catherine, uh, whose uh, nephew happened to be the emperor. All right. Uh, some of you know that story. Uh, uh, let me tell it to you briefly. All right. So the, uh, Catherine was married to King Henry's brother. His brother died. 
And so he took her as his wife, but she, can, she never did give birth to any sons. He, uh, he got his eye on a lady by the name of Anne Bolin and decided he wanted to, uh, that he was in love with Anne and at, uh, sent a request to uh, Pope Clement. Uh, Clement was the Pope at this time. Uh, sent a request to him to annul the, his marriage to Catherine. Well, the Roman Catholic Church does not, uh, did not at that time, did, uh, there, were, there was no law, no provision. In fact, there's, uh, their stand was against divorce of any kind. So uh, that was a minor detail. Uh, the major detail was that uh, Clement the Pope was imprisoned by Charles V, emperor, all right? Okay, so you have Charles the Emperor, Clement the Pope, imprisoned by Charles, King Henry asking for the marriage to be annulled between him and Catherine, Catherine happening to be the aunt of the emperor. Okay? So there's no way in the world the man, the Pope, who is imprisoned by this lady's aunt is going to, go, is going to cross this guy. And so that's probably the real reason that he did not grant King Henry his annulment. And so in 1529, King Henry uh, wrote to Parliament and said, uh, I want you to declare that insofar as the law of Christ allows, that I am the head of the church. And so they did. And that effectively cut off uh, at least for King Henry, he felt like that established for him a jurisdiction that uh, before then was, was the Pope's. And so that was the first step. That was the first of several steps. And so uh, uh, then in due time, the church, the, the new church uh, in England uh, decided that, well, in reality, the marriage to Catherine was never valid in the first place. All right. So he, he divorced Catherine and the same year married Anne and I don't know if they I, I doubt that she lived happily ever after but nonetheless that was the story that was that was the impetus behind the Church of England all right so how's that for a reformation uh, now there's a lot more than that William Tyndale you know William Tyndale he translated the New Testament into English so that's where the real reformation was happening it's just that the official break of the Church of England from uh, from Rome took place all because of his marriage, his refusal to, uh, to submit to uh, what he probably should have in the first place. But uh, William Tyndale, uh, so what, what do they give to us? Uh, obviously the King James later, the King James Bible, uh, the Book of Common Prayer, uh, which I use even here, and, and I put American, I never finished that, but um, several American traditions, the Methodist tradition being one of those uh, stemming largely from the English Reformation. All right, are there any questions, comments? There's so much here to cover. I'd feel bad that I would even attempt. Oh, really? Okay. All right, very neat. Good. Yeah. All right. Thank you for being here. Now, I will next, next week... I look forward to this. Next week, I will talk about the, what's called the Counter-Reformation. At least it's called that by, by Protestants. Uh, and I will talk about what the Roman Catholic Church did and has done to try to reform themselves and whether or not, of course, that's been successful. Uh, but we'll talk about Reformation within the Catholic Church itself next week. And then that will conclude... Uh, maybe, let's see here, yes. Uh, maybe, I don't know, I'm still trying to decide what to do next summer. Uh, for our uh, Wednesday night study, uh, eight-week study. Uh, I'm thinking about maybe something church history related, but we'll see when we get there. But uh, for now, uh, let's uh, prepare our hearts for our morning worship service.